Welcome back to the second part of our intro to quality and safety lecture. Uh, I'm excited again to introduce Dr. Ansel to finish up the second part of his talk. Um, Dr. Ansel is our former chief medical officer here at Rush and now our vice president, senior vice president for system integration. And in this exercise, which is in front of you, and I'm going to allow you some time to read, we're going to talk about something that is called normalization of deviance or normalization of risk. Uh, and this is a case, this is actually based on real life events here, so please read through the case and we'll uh, walk you through how do you assess what's going on uh, and how do you address this issue of normalization of deviance. All right, we're going to take this case uh, and just like we did before, fill out uh, those root cause analysis fishbone diagram and just list out all of the uh, pieces of this and take some time uh, to do this. And when we're done, move on to the next uh, portion of this. So, in what happened here. In this case, there were errors and harm reached uh, the baby who eventually recovered but could experience problems later in childhood. And it's easy for us to blame Joe, the attending physician, for losing track of his patient. Joe, of course, felt terrible about what happened. The C-section was delayed for a few hours. and If he could have done it again, he said he would have operated hours earlier. And I just want to take a step back here. You know, we all make mistakes. Uh, things will go wrong on our shifts. And just by our very nature and our training uh, and the selection process that is needed to get us to be competent physicians or nurses, we tend to be perfectionists and we tend to blame ourselves. And uh, we've got to take care of ourselves as well when a bad thing occurs. And it's really important for Joe in this case to be able to be given some uh, availability of counseling or sit with a senior leader to talk it through, to check in with uh, how he's doing, maybe give him some time off from work. Burnout's a big problem uh, in medicine. And it's, it's actually, uh, we tend to be tougher on ourselves uh, than we are on others. And I just want to point that out, that we forget about the s second victim in these types of cases, which is the physician or the nurse themselves that sees themselves as being accountable for the error. Um, but there are things we can learn from this case about systems. Uh, in this situation, the issue was not the technical skill of the SCAF. They were very technic uh, technically uh, skilled. This was not a situation where an attending physician wasn't present, uh, so lack of supervision really wasn't the critical uh, thing there, or their ability to assess the clinical scenario. Can you identify the root cause uh, of this adverse event? Uh, in, in, in my mind, uh, the root cause of this event was uh, inadequate staffing. So the, uh, the unit was inadequately staffed uh, uh, to manage the load that night uh, because this has happened so many times before. Uh, they just say, okay, we're going to just pull it together. But they've, what they've done in this situation is really tolerate unsafe conditions. And, you know, Many, many times you can tolerate unsafe conditions and never have harm occur. And so people then rely on the fact that harm didn't occur the last time this happened. We were able to all pull together and make something work. And yet uh, this normalization of deviance uh, actually sets up the conditions for which harm will occur. And normalization of deviance is defined as the gradual process through which unacceptable practices or standards become acceptable. And as the deviant behavior is repeated without catastrophic results, it becomes a social norm for the organization. So let me give you a couple of other examples within, within healthcare uh, where that uh, happens. Uh, there's a surge in the emergency room. 
maybe Lollapalooza's on, and a lot of the party goers there have gotten sick. And then what do you do about your staffing? You're the attending or the nurse on call, and you realize you're not staffed for that volume. So that happens all the time. Uh, it happens certainly in trauma units, and when there's a mass trauma or mass casualty type of, of event uh, that that occurs. Someone doesn't wash their hands, and the patient doesn't get an infection. And we, that, that normalization of risk or deviance occurs all the time in healthcare. We see somebody doing something that's unsafe in healthcare. Maybe they're wearing their scrubs outside of the hospital. Maybe they're eating in the patient care area. Uh, maybe they're uh, not labeling specimens the right way, and we don't say something. That's normalization of deviance uh, as well. Can you give an example from outside of healthcare? I'm going to give you one in a second that was a big national one, but the, probably the most common one in this day and age is people texting while driving or speaking on the phone while driving. Uh, the believing that you can get away with it because nothing's happened before, and yet the evidence shows that uh, harm occurs from these behaviors. But the uh, one of the national uh, events was the Columbia accident. And uh, this is a picture of the Columbia Space Shuttle. That's when we had the Space Shuttle program. Uh, and this is part of the reason why the Space Shuttle program got shut down. And what happened is with the Space Shuttle uh, that there were pieces of uh, fire protection that routinely fell off and yet these pla these uh, shuttles landed safely uh, without this uh, insulation uh, except on this occasion. Uh, the prior one uh, was the O-rings. When the O-rings uh, in the cold, the prior shuttle disaster was that the, the O-rings that were supposed to hold the jet fuel in, in the cold contracted, which is a typical response of rubber uh, rings to cold, and yet people knew about these things and didn't do anything about it. So they knew about these tiles falling off, and yet they uh, normalized the deviance here. And you can see here in uh, this next picture uh, where the insulation had come off the exterior of the space shuttle. So. That's, uh, that's an example from real life in, uh, in the eyes uh, witnessed by uh, millions of people, the space shuttle, uh, uh, you know, incinerated. So I want to take a, a step back and t talk about once you've looked at an event and once you've done your fishbone diagram and you've broken this into the what are the generative causes uh, here, uh, and when either harms occurred uh, to the patient or very come close to the patient, what you want to be able to do is uh, judge, uh, you know, what to do now. What do you do in response when harm occurs? And I just, here is a framework for thinking of uh, organizational fairness and just culture. And down the left are different types of cultures. Uh, and I'm going to start from the go from the bottom up. So at the bottom is an unmindful culture, uh, no awareness of safety culture, and a belief that don't say one word here. Uh, uh, there's no good for talking about mistakes. Reactive, playing defense, reacting to events. So a culture that actually reacts to defense, uh, reacts to events, and is reactive, is better than one that's unmindful, but is still reactive. Uh, you know, in, and in reactive cultures, uh, it depends who the boss is, whether you respond to the event or not, and the blame and punishment are common. Systematic a culture is systems are in place to manner hazards. Remember I talked before is there are always going to be hazards, and the, what we want to do is harm occurs when a hazard reaches a patient. And much of what we do in healthcare is hazardous. So, uh, in a in a systematic culture, it's well un understood algorithms, learning's a priority, 
uh, one learns from other events and puts processes in place to improve them. So proactive uh, culture is one where you're playing offense, thinking ahead, anticipating solving problems. Clear ways to differentiate individual versus system error and is safe to discuss uh, mistakes. You know, when we do our surveys uh, of patient safety at our institution at Rush, uh, uh, still too many people uh, report that they don't think it's safe to uh, speak up and report events. Uh, so if you don't think it's safe to stop someone and tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, clean your hands before you go in the room, or you see someone wearing a, uh, an isolation gown uh, going out of a room or not putting one in a room, that's not a proactive culture. We're really trying to get there. And a generative culture is an organization that's wired for safety and improvement. Real events are shared by leaders. There's a true culture of accountability and learning. And uh, that's where we want to go, uh, where there's transparency, there's openness, uh, and there's understanding. So the idea of this, of deviation uh, uh, and the normalization of deviance is true in any system. Uh, and uh, this is a little bit of a complicated chart, but the, it's, it's actually normal for boundaries to move. So if you look at the right side of the chart, uh, what you would call that is uh, that your expected safe space of action is occurs 100% of the time. You might call that high reliability uh, on the right side, where uh, everything is done uh, uh, the right way every single time. And, you know, that is actually what quality is defined at, is doing the right thing for the patient uh, or the situation every single time with every element there. Uh, regulation and uh, accreditation standards uh, help you get there, but without that step down of a detailed standard work around uh, expected quality, uh, you can't get to what I would describe as high rel reliability. As you move over uh, uh, to the left, there's another thing here. If there's a, uh, if the if the level of production is not highly complex, it's easier to be highly reliable. And the more complex that systems get, the more likely uh, there are to be accidents. In the middle space here is the usual space of uh, of action: illegal, normal. Uh, normalization of deviance, where we accept things, uh, we tolerate uh, uh, deviances, deviation from norms. Uh, there's a, a, a saying in patient safety that what we tolerate, we promote. So if you're in a, a clinical area where we tolerate people not washing their hands, we tolerate people not using checklists for putting central lines in. You know, these are illegal, normal standards. Everyone knows it's you have to wash your hands, but if we tolerate it, uh, that becomes this usual space of action, illegal, normal. And a lot of stuff that we do is at this level, like hand washing, 90%. You know, uh, use of a checklist reliably, you know, is never at 100% in this type of thing, uh, uh, space. And of course, uh, as you move on to the left, uh, there's, you know, a place where everyone would agree that it's non-acceptable. Uh, putting the wrong kidney in a patient. We know we would have 100% agreement uh, that it's non-acceptable. Amputating the wrong leg, uh, leaving a retained foreign object in, 100% non-agreeable, very unsafe space, uh, and a high production, high speed environment necessary, a uh, chance for accident to occur. But these accidents occur when these uh, uh, the boundaries of normal become larger and larger and we allow deviation from standards. So if you don't have a set of highly reliable standards, even in your lowest production areas, when you get to your highest production areas, you're likely to have harm occur. And this is again called normalization of deviance. Uh, and is something uh, to avoid. So 
we, harm has occurred in the case of Joe, Joe's situation, uh, he's accountable, but what should happen to him in this situation? So there is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this is a way of assessing errors, a high level way of assessing errors in a fair and just culture. And uh, there's a lot of uh, ways to think of uh, uh, culture, but the best way to think about it is there's two extremes. On the one extreme to the left is disciplinary action. And where disciplinary action uh, is uh, needs to occur, if there's, let's say there's a 100% agreement that the behavior involved was uh, deviant, it was criminal, it was intentional, it was reckless, it, it violated a rule uh, that was, let's call it a red rule, a line that everyone in the organization understands you can't cross if there was patient abuse or if you routinely violated standards. So let's take hand washing. Let's say you repeatedly violate policies, preachers of standard of, of, of hand washing that might lead to disciplinary uh, behavior. Uh, failure to report an area by self or others might be deviant enough, you know, as a serious event it didn't report to be disciplinary action or error during the substance abuse. On the far right is judgment errors uh, when there's no policy, an error made by incorrect interpretation of the policy or an error made while following the policy or processes, but the policy or processes are difficult to understand. We had a, we had a, uh, uh, the wrong blood given, and while that could have caused an ABO uh, reaction, which it luckily didn't in this case, we thought that there was a uh, de deviation from our policy, uh, but when we dug into the case and did a root cause, we realized our policy was so confusing and the process by which it needed to be applied so confusing that we decided it was a system error and we needed then to fix the system. So over on the left-hand side is an HR or medical staff process. Over on the right-hand side, there's coaching uh, to the individual, but you gotta fix the system. In the case of the uh, this night on the OB unit, uh, this was a coaching and system improvement uh, opportunity. In the situation that I uh, described, in the case that I described, we realized that the staffing levels were not staffed to be able to tolerate a surge in patient volume. And that led to a whole reorganization of the way that the OB unit uh, uh, was operated. And uh, Joe participated in that uh, reorganization. And now we have a safer underlying system. There is a gray area. Uh, in a gray area in between disciplinary and coaching system. But by just using an algorithm, it helps you sort this out. Now, you could almost say everything's a system issue, uh, and we don't want to deny personal accountability because sometimes the buck just stops uh, with the individual. But using an algorithm like this uh, is um, uh, an important way to sort these out. In the gray area of the middle uh, is what happens with residents or new trainees, failure to seek assistance when unsure of skills. People are too cocky about what they know how to do. Asking for help is one of the best things to do uh, when, there's, uh, when there's trouble. Uh, so the key gray area questions you wanna ask when you're in this gray area and you can't decide whether it's on the left disciplinary or on the right a systematic uh, improvement, did the person intend the actions? How do you know they intended it? Did they come to work impaired? Is the person competent in their role? How do you know? Did they break reasonable rules or policies with three other people make the same mistake? So there's a great question to ask. Could somebody else in the same situation as Joe on that very night, competent, capable, make the same mistake? And the answer we would say would be yes, anyone could have made that mistake. And then, you know, what's your response uh, then depends on how you judge things. Um, you know, if people are malicious, there's got to be uh, discipline. Uh, and, you know, there might have to be immediate suspension. So this is one that takes a lot of thought, but you can't avoid doing it. If someone's the biggest producer, uh, they bring in a lot of money, they bring in a lot of cases, 
that can't get in the way of you making judgments here. Um, you know, this, use your best judgment to categorize each action as either reckless, risky, or unintentional based on the definitions. And the categorizations uh, determine the general level of culpability and possible disciplinary actions. And so, you know, uh, unintentional error, the caregiver is not accountable, the caregiver should participate, investigate why the error occurred, and teach others about it. So these are, these are great things when an unintentional error occurs to take these cases out and talk about them in your unit. Let other people know, because this is like, could three other people make this mistake? Yes, well, let three other people know. Uh, you know, risky ask action, making an unsafe choice, uh, the the caregiver should receive coaching and perhaps teach others. Of course, reckless action requires retraining, discipline uh, uh, as well. You know, three other people with similar spills could do the same thing in a similar uh, situation. If the answer is no, the person's accountable. <clears throat> that's why that's such a great question. And if we the answer is, oh, <coughs> We do it this way all the time, or the answers are divided. <coughs> Excuse me. Assign accountability as is listed below. And important. Remember, the important goal is to ensure that others perceive the responses as fair. So, if the system supports reckless action and requires fixing, the caregiver is pr less accountable for the action, and system leaders share in the accountability. So, this is one thing where you got to ask yourself. Is it a leadership issue? Is it a, is it a unit or institutional leadership issue? I don't know, do, have the leaders been tolerating unsafe situations in their midst? Uh, the example here, you got a clapsy uh, infection, someone didn't follow the bundle, uh, but, the, but the unit's not following the bundle and there's no system accountability for it. Uh, you've got to raise, raise that up to the leadership. The system supports risky action and requires fixing. The caregiver is probably less accountable for the action and system leaders share in the uh, 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 accountability for this as well. You know, the, the, uh, if the leadership has been allowing it, uh, then you've got to go to leadership. Sometimes the leadership is not allowing it and the system has just risk uh, involved in it. Um, you know, on the far right side is, you know, what's, what's, what's similar about these different things is in all situations, the system is supporting things. On the far left is supporting reckless action. On the, in the middle, the system supports risky action, which is a level down from reckless. And on the right-hand side, the system supports error and requires fixing. Uh, in each situation, the leaders are accountable uh, for it. Uh, and, you know, hopefully you're not working in a system that support, supports reckless action, but many of us have work in situations where risky or errors uh, are supported. Anyway, I'm going to end there. Uh, I think we've sort of covered everything for this session, which was understanding that when an event occurs, uh, it often occurs in a situation where we've normalized uh, risky uh, or reckless or sometimes just unsafe conditions. That under those uh, conditions, we have to make a, a, an assessment of whether the, there's individual uh, responsibility and discipline that's needed or their system uh, fixes. We talked about normalization of risk or normalization of deviance and how that can occur and how those boundaries can slip over time. And I mentioned the concept of what we tolerate, we promote. And when we tolerate uh, the things in low risk situations and we let things go and we're not willing to speak up about them, uh, that's a situation where harm can occur in more complex uh, situations as well. And then we ended with just showing how to use an algorithm approach to assessing whether uh, the accountability lies at the individual level or the system level. Thank you very much. Uh, we really enjoyed your, your talk and thank you for being a part of our, our quality and safety elective. Well, thank you.